let's uh, let's 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 move. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Do you want to? Do you want to? I can pass off to some introduction. This is this is my provocation. To let's get going because we have the amazing Dorothy Moninez in the house, and she needs to get some rest for tonight's show. But um, a round of applause for Dorothy's uh, performance last night. Thank you. Um. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think you know, it's th this this moment is called a provocation, but I think all the provocation happened last night at Nyla and your work, Le Mai. Um, so thank you for you know obviously bringing your artistry and this incredible ensemble of performers to um, to New York and and um, and to LA next week. Um, I've been a longtime fan of you as an artist. Uh, we worked together with Alain Bouffard uh, in Baron Samedi um, years ago. And um, your work has just um, continued to wow me and, um, and just kind of manifest so many incredible approaches to the question of history and how history is lived out and crafted in performance. Um, so I, the first question is, um, you know, you're, you're this ensemble of performers. I want to hear about how you found them, how you came together, and what what the sort of you know initial proposition for the performance was to them. How did you bring them in? Thank you, Will. Hello, everyone. We started talking in English. Oh yeah, pardon. We on peut, on peut French français. or not? But we yeah. Shall we continue in English? Yeah. Okay. 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 Good. Um, so yes, I'm so happy to when when I had this. Uh, invitation and I realized that my partner was going to be Will, Kroll, Will Rolls. I was like, of course, I will wake up early, earlier than usual to be here. Um, and last night performing at Nyla was actually very emotional for me because the last time I was on stage there was with Will Rolls, David Thompson, Shlingri, Madalala Lushaba, Nadia Bergre and Olivier Normand, we were performing in Baron Samedi, this piece. Um, so coming back felt like a, like a return and felt like um, another um, portal um, into this other work uh, that is called Mai. And to answer your question, um, yeah, for the past few years I've been touring both in Europe, in France particularly as well, and across the sea, so coming to America, going to Brazil, Chile, I went to uh, Africa as well, and I met incredible artists. And that's why it's so good to, when one has the opportunity to, to travel, one has a passport that gets uh, either visas or even the American visa is hard to get. But uh, when one is able to come over and perform, there is this encounter with phenomenal creative beings. And every time I performed, it, it, it really felt like I was entering another realm and I met, so in America I had met one performer, uh, actually no, I met her in Lagos in Nigeria, but she's from Chicago, her name is Kiera Collins. And then I met uh, another artist who is based in Belo Horizonte in Brazil, Zora Santos, who was much, much older than I because I really cared about this whole generational um, aspect of the piece. How is knowledge transmitted? How is our craft able to travel from the young guest to the oldest among us? Um, and then I met, I had met many, many years ago, Yinka Essie Graves, the f who is the flamenco dancer, for those who were there yesterday. Not just flamenco dancer, but she's a flamenco artist and, um, let's say, multidisciplinary. Um, I had met her in school, in secondary school in London. We went to the uh, Lycée Francais uh, together. So I've known her for many, many years. And when I found out that she had become a dancer, of course I was drawn to her craft and I invited her as well. Uh, Asma Jama, who is the poet uh, in the piece, I met her in Bristol in England 
um, and I was really moved by her work and her words. Um, and she moved me also because she's the youngest among us, but the, the maturity of her work and the, her sensitivity also really resonated with me. So I wanted her to be part of the, the piece. Uh, and Ife Day, I had met in Haiti, in Port-au-Prince, when I was there for um, a workshop and um, uh, had been invited by Kathleen Noel there. So I guess that's how the journey began. Um, and I, at one point, my former production manager was like, are you going to stop? Because I think I would have continued in the it, with the... The, the many artists I was meeting, I kept coming back. I was like, oh my God, I met this incredible dance. Like, he was like, we don't have a budget. <laughs> we don't have the budget for that. So maybe we should just like stop. He wanted, he wanted me, of course he was there to encourage me and, you know, uh, not sort of uh, tell me I have to think uh, money wise, but to encourage the artistic dream. But it's good that he was there. Otherwise, you would have had a crowd on stage, a bigger <laughs> crowd. Um, and uh, the title of the piece, of course, Les Mai, is um, mesh for those who aren't translating from French, um, which, of course, brings up the image of just like um, a weaving together of, of stories and, and, and histories and also practices. You have, um, you know, um, this performer who's trained in flamenco dance, you know, who and you're some of your barefoot and she's wearing flamenco shoes. And so also like the practices that you all are bringing into the room are allowed to be present as your modes of communication. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just curious, yeah, how like in terms of um, then pulling out stories and think because this because of course the piece is thinking through histories of, of, of violence as well as kind of um, loving transmission and support. And I'm curious how you how you started to cultivate those conversations and um, and decided to not all sort of work in the same methods of dance, you know, but try to um, allow, preserve that individuality. That's like a four questions in one. Yeah, um, more than four. It's more than four, okay. Um, how did you make <laughs> no, the piece? Ish, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, um, so the piece, uh, so I had I mentioned all these wonderful African and Afro-descendant um, artists that I had been meeting, and I forgot to mention Nido Owera, who is um, also on stage, um, born in Burundi, but she's Rwandan. And the reason um, why I almost didn't mention her, and also Elsa Mulder, actually, who wasn't there yesterday on stage, normally we're six on stage, and yesterday we were five, uh, is Ethiopian. She's moved back to Ethiopia. Um, and I really cared that uh, their names also are mentioned. Uh, but because of the pandemic um, in 2020, that's when the idea actually of creating the piece, uh, that was the year that I had wanted to create the piece, but of course we know how things changed uh, drastically in, in those months. Um, so Zora Santos from Belo Horizonte and Kiara Collins from Chicago were no longer able to come to France to, to rehearse with me and to rehearse with us. Um, so I, I had to rethink the work and to, um, but, to, to, but to keep, to keep the, 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 the stories that I wanted to transmit or I wanted to share between us. Again, this question of um, um, like coming from a generation of Nido, which is older than myself, and the generation of Asma Jama, who is younger than myself. And how does history and stories move through from the youngest to the oldest uh, of us? Because Elsa, no, um, Zora was the, would have been the oldest member, but she couldn't make it. Um, so I began by asking them questions. Uh, since we couldn't gather physically, I sent out a number of many questions, sometimes four questions in one. Uh, it's a good strategy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I really wanted to know very simple things, I guess, like how are they taking care of themselves? What, what, um, how do they take care of their body, their mental health? Uh, because I know that all of us have gone through different um, trials and tribulations and 
um, the question of rootlessness or uh, being uprooted or uh, exile or um, self-imposed exile too. Sometimes it's not all from coming from outside, but how this movement uh, from one place to the other, uh, what is the question, what is our relationship to land, uh, ancestral land, uh, our current land, because some of us, you know, are living where we were not born. What is that new land of birth, um, of belonging, let's say? So I had um, many, many questions like that. And, you know, how do we take care of our hair, our nails? Like, just like non superficial things, because it's good to take care of one's hair and one's nails. You know, like, take self care is part of the resistance, right? And uh, and in those days of COVID, I think we were also afraid uh, of each other, and and this distance created. In in ans in sending these questions, I think I reduced the distance that existed between us. Uh, and this the, the I felt like this work was about gathering the dispersed, because that was the whole idea. The 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 African or the Afro descendants I wanted to gather on stage for my were were dispersed you know across continents and so the stage for me was that space of attempting to gather the children of the dispersed or the dispersed and so the 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 idea of of um of joy as a as a as a tool of gathering you know when we gather we gather for for banquets or for a meal or for actually Zora Santos, who couldn't join us, was a chef and an actress. I would have had food on stage, <laughs> you know. So, what this idea of, um, of of a gathering of gathering, yes, the dispersed. Because there's a book by Beata Omobie Imeres. She's a French Rwandan author, and she wrote a book called "Tous tes enfants dispersés," um, or your dispersed children, I guess. Uh, it could be translated as, and um, and I f I felt like borrowing this idea of gathering the dispersed and gathering the stories of the dispersed, and in so doing, finding joy in that yeah. and strength in that. And kind of thinking about provocation, the way that you've talked about this work is not as an author that is signing the work and kind of you know that there is a there's a there's you make a kind of an insistence on the idea of collaboration. Um, can you talk more about the choice to sort of foreground that? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, it's true that this this piece really uh, is like, um, I had the yarn, the yarn, uh, and uh, the, the, you know, the, the thread, I, it's like each one of us is, 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 a, is part of this thread. Because when you look at the thread, it's m made up of many little other threads. So me, I just was there to loop the movements to loop the 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 the, the poetry to loop mm, the the words and the voices and the music and it's true that each one of them be it uh, the the dancers and the poet on stage the music the musician I, it was a collaboration also with two composers Alain Maé with whom I've been collaborating for many many years as well as Ben Lamar Gay who's a wonderful phenomenal composer musician from Chicago, and uh, I keep coming to America, huh? you hear this? Yeah, um, and as well as uh, um, a costume designer called Stephanie Couder, uh, who has truly understood the way that I want to create space for the body to, to move, or the, the volumes within which we can explore and inhabit, it's like, the clothes themselves become another layer of the story. Um, so each one of us um, was answering questions, mm -hmm. sometimes four questions in one. Sorry, I'm going to come back to that. Wow. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, they, and, 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 they, and in, the, in the answers, I found, the answers they gave me uh, what I used in order to to, to create this work. So it's really a collaboration. And, um, you know, although in the end it's true that I I decided, I decide what is 
what it becomes or what it is, but it's also a space that they contributed to, absolutely. And I mean, I, without you know, without this sort of spoiling what is in the show, I think this you use this word tricoté, you know, um, and that you know when you tricoté something, it is all about you know the yarn itself, but also the spaces in between, right? And and in in the design of the stage, there's all this kind of empty space. There's a there's a flamenco stage that's kind of installed on top of the stage, and then there's you know, these these fabrics and costumes hanging from the ceiling and microphones kind of dispersed throughout. So there's a, a kind of consciousness about the space between you that is kind of palpable and maintained. And I just thought that choice was really, um, really powerful. And, and also in insisting on kind of gathering the dispersed, like both the dispersal and the gathering are happening kind of all the time in the work. Um, hmm. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, I'm curious about also as you tr like, what are some of the before we kind of open it up for questions for the room? Like, what are some of the responses you're getting from people who are coming to the work that you find are wh where where are there moments of identification with the work, or where that you know, like, how do you how do you interact with the audiences who are seeing the work, and do you have an opportunity to kind of talk to people who are identifying with the work in some way, or I'm just always curious about that, mm -hmm. that like the specificity of your experience and also the desire for the public to, you know, identify. Mm -hmm. um, as I was saying, so we created, we premiered during the year of 2020. So um, actually even premiering the work was in itself a miracle. You know, it felt like, uh, something quite exceptional. It was in October, just before the second confinement um, in Belgium. So it, it, it really felt we passed through something, like a loop. We, we had space to create and then boom, they, 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 they shut the, the borders again and we were locked in uh, in our homes. Um, so every time we come onto the stage, it feels like, um, like a special uh, gift or like a special, uh, moment that we dedicate both to, to, to the ancestors, that we we dedicate to our fellow dispersed um, beings around the world. And we, like it's an intention, like that's what we do uh, before we get on stage. And um, and at the same time, it's uh, it feels like a celebration, truly, because I really wanted to tap into, into that, into that aspect of finding joy in being together in moving together and resonating with each other, even with the absent, because it's true, the absent are also present, uh, or we come accompanied by, by them. Uh, and the audience members, um, I guess, I guess, you know, some, some young people, for example, Asma is a visibly hijabi uh, young woman. So she's, uh, she has a um, hijab, right? Uh, visibly Muslim. And um, in places where we've performed, I've had, or she's had uh, some really wonderful feedback from other hijabi young girls. Like, I didn't know I could get on stage and rap. I didn't know I could get on stage and sing. And I, couldn't, I didn't know I could get on stage and like shout. And I was like, yes, that's what this piece is also about, uh, inspiring one, one that feels or, uh, or like they couldn't or wouldn't uh, or were kept to the margin of this space, uh, what it allows as a, what, what plant, what seed uh, is possible, has the possibility to grow. So that, that's one of the feedback we get, like a lot of enthusiasm uh, from young people, particularly young people, I, I find that they, they're, they're, they really, it really resonates with them. Um, and also at times when uh, there's a lot of uh, upheaval and political, uh, 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 how, how do I say, uh, unrest, um, I feel it in, this, in, in, in the piece also. I feel that the people come in there fully charged of what's happening in the world, and of course what's happening on stage somehow also reflects it, but in a poetic or, a, or another form, and that, and that form um, is, is somehow healing, even though we are there screaming our rage. 
And if we are there screaming our pain, we are, th we are there moving through joy and through beauty because it was so imperative for me to have us looking so beautiful. And we are, aren't we? Surely. We. Yes. So I really thought that beauty is also a form of resistance uh, and beauty is a form of um, resilience and, um, and existence. And Stéphanie Couder, again, I insist on her work, um, is, is, is creates sabla, sab, elle sublime, I don't know how to, to say this, elle sublime le corps. Uh, mm -hmm. like yes, exalt. Voilà. And the way she, she the, the, the colors that she, she put together for her costumes, and the, it's all part of, a, of her journey, because she was born in Baghdad, grew up in France, she's French, and and even the orange the orange color that you see is like this sunset or this this light, you know. Um, so yeah, every time I, I wear her things, um, I also th celebrate who she is and what her journey is in the world. Mm. So yeah, I guess there is a quite a few enthusiastic people after the performance. They're moved by it somehow. I was very moved, and um, okay. Um, are there questions? Wait, oh. let's talk about you. Um, no, hold on. Th this is hold on, hold oh, yeah. on. What is this? Quick. What is this? What's this the meaning is, of life? This is this is this uh, is, uh, this is uh, um, let me provoke this whole situation. Uh, <laughs> Wait a minute. This is how it's been since day one. Well, tell us tell us about what you're busy with and. Um, How's, how's, yeah, what are you busy with at the moment? Um, I'm making, or I, I premiered a work this, uh, this spring um, with five performers that is um, looking at um, the question of filmmaking and the photographic capture of black gestures and black bodies. So it's a work in which there's a camera on stage taking a photo every three seconds and the performers are moving in the sort of stop motion kind of suspension and then find ways to sort of navigate away from the camera and in and out. And um, it was also a work that premiered, or tr was supposed to premiere before the pandemic, then during the pandemic. And I'm not sure if the pandemic's over. It's it, yes and no. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Um, it's also absent and present with us, right. like so many other people and spirits. Um, so yeah, um, so it was, you know, stop motion animation, you know, it was a very slow form of filmmaking and arduous and grueling and it's just kind of a staging of that, but also a lot of joy, like the, the labor of becoming a moving image and, um, and the joy and exchange between performers when you're kind of stuck inside of a, a role that is laborious, how do you kind of animate it in ways other than the animation that you're being used to produce? Um, Anyway, so, but the pandemic kind of turned it into this, also this question of care and how the, a performance and a choreographic process is greater than just the, the grant proposal and even the sort of aesthetic evolution I'm trying to go, to, go through. You know, it's a deeply collaborative project and um, yeah. And uh, it's also spanning a, t a, a time period where there's been so much loss like in everyone's life involved in the project and so it's become a container for um, more than just you know performances you know, and performativity and questions of choreography it's sort of like a, a container whose edges keep expanding as the time that we've What's seen. What's it called? Uh, sicker. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen it? Has anybody seen it in the audience? No one in this room has seen it. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Sorry. Yes. No one's seen it. Come on. really? <laughs> yes. Actually, a few people here have seen it. Tara Willis presented it at the MCA Chicago. Uh -huh. And um, Ashley Farrow Murray. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a performance that tours with a video installation. Okay. So I also film the performance and make a video installation. And Ashley, Ashley Farrow Murray and her former role at Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center produced the film shoot that then Brilliant. became the video installation. And John Hubiar um, went inside in Portland. Anyway. Hey, nice, nice. And do you the, feel like today performing this work um, has a, how does it 
Déborde. Débordé. Oh my God. Bypass or like overflow? Overflow. Yeah. yeah. How does it overflow the space and 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 continue beyond what what is this space that you have created? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I think it's the kind of piece that because it's made in a certain way and was unmade and, and kind of undone by so many challenges along the way that um, it's something that I can never put down. You know what I mean? Like it's both something I hold dear and I want to get rid of and so there's, but there's no clear end in sight. Even when the project is over, I won't be sure that it's over, that I've done what I set out to do, which is true of all works, you know, I think, but um, but the performers are, I said this yesterday, the performers are aging, their bodies are changing, their jobs are changing, they've lost parents, I've lost a parent, they've, you know, they've gotten new jobs, everyone has, lives in a new city than the city they were living in when we started the project. Um, so I, so those, those kind of stories had to be incorporated into um, my understanding of them as performers as we collaborated and therefore I'm invested in them and their lives beyond you know how they're useful for the work you know so I think it's a reinvestment in their lives and um, collaborating as a colleague and friend um, yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah thank you that was a good question <laughs> and it was just one question which I appreciate um, questions from the room It's a microphone. Thank you. Um, hi. I want to ask um, Dorothy um, about um, your relation to black joy compared to the phenomenon of black joy in America. Can you speak to that in, in your work? Uh, and also, Raul, Will, can you talk about Sao Paulo a little bit, your Biennale? Yeah. So, I'm an African, right? Um, it doesn't mean I'm not American in a way that I can relate to black joy in America. But I will speak from a um, point, from my, my standpoint of an African Rwandan uh, creative artist living in Europe. Um, it's true that joy has always been there, even through the darkest of times. It's, it's as though um, it, it was there before it was even named what it is. It, it, it's like, it's been there. I re even when you asked me the question, my grandmothers just appeared, like just came to me. Uh, because they are the ones, when they welcome me they in, into their home, for example, she would just get up and dance, you know, as she sings in Kinyarwanda. And that is, for me, the most joyful and the most joyous and the most uh, loving way of, 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 of being in her arms. And she was a healer. One of them was a healer, um, like physical healer, spiritual healer. She was constantly singing and dancing. And I guess this joy is what she was transmitting without naming it, without saying that's what it is, but it's carrying me even to this day to share with my African and Afro-descendant communities dispersed around the world. And when I come into a space, I know that I'm equipped with that joy because it's somehow deeply rooted um, in me and I need to now consciously pull it up or, 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 or bring it to the surface and use it as a tool, again, of resisting this, this, uh, this situation that, or these situations that make me want to literally fall and disappear and, and no longer be here, you know. Um, so I get, I do, I do feel connected to, to, to black joy, wherever it is, because I'm connected to the people wherever they are, I'm, 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 I'm part of this fabric. Mm -hmm. If we come back to, to my, I'm, f I'm part of this diasporic fabric now. I'm part of this, the, um, it's bigger than I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the threads 
And in, in this thread, I feel like I can hang on to the joy that I had already, but that is expanding and, 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 and growing and becoming thicker and brighter and, and stronger as I engage politically in this act of black joy. <laughs> um, I am presenting an installation and a performance in the Sao Paulo Biennial right now. Um, I work a lot with language and dance and the transitions between the two. The project I just spoke about is like my first foray into film and video. Um, and that project is, well, how's this, oh, yeah, this is like a long story. Um, in the 70s, my dad and Tina Turner met. And so, um, so, and they both passed away this year. And so heading into Brazil, um, Tina Turner also gave the largest concert in history in Rio de Janeiro in 1988 to 180,000 people. Um, so she has a deep, there's a deep kind of love and kind of wonder about her uh, in the Brazilian cultural memory. Um, and, you know, uh, so I was thinking about how to think of Tina as a, as a way into Brazil as a context um, and what's love got to do with it um, as a song that was her comeback song and kind of a revival song. So this project is... There's a wall and I've printed an alphabet. There's like a QWERTY keyboard on the wall and the performers undo the keyboard and spell out the lyrics to What's Love Got To Do With It. Um, but because it felt ethic ethically wrong to have Brazilian performers working only in English, um, I we also talked about the sort of long tradition of Brazilian love songs and songs of pain and joy. Um, uh, very much from an Afro-Brazilian perspective as well. And so we could, they kind of weave together a, a script of the lyrics of What's Love Got To Do With It and other Brazilian love songs. And so they're kind of deconstructing both of these colonial languages and, um, and leaving a kind of hyper-coded trace. So when the performance is not happening, you have this kind of... Um, riddle, um, which feels to me like what love is meant mm -hmm. to leave us with. An unsolvable but constantly engaging riddle. So yeah, it's both a memorial and a love song at the same time. Yeah. Other questions? Thank you both. I wonder if you would like to share a little bit about the experience of meeting each other when working with Anne Dufar, um, coming, you know, with different backgrounds, I imagine, different um, trajectories, and then meeting Alain, this, who was working in France then, right, um, in a particular environment, um, and yeah, the process of um, meeting each other, but also um, uh, 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 through Alain Buffard's choreographic process um, at that point. When was that? 2013 or? 2011. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, I mean, I was broke and Alain Buffard <laughs> came to New York and did an audition. I was like, I want a European dance job and I got it. So um, that was like the, that was, and that caused many transformations in my life, but chief amongst which was being put into the room with Dorothée, Lengue, Lushaba Matlala, who's based in Johannesburg, Nadia Begre, who's Montpellier, um, David Thompson, who's over there, um, Olivier Normand, uh, and then two musicians, Sarah Murcia and Seb, Seb Martel. Um, scenography by Nadia Loro, so just like a like superstar, awesome group. Um, but I was, but it was interesting because I think Alain was also then asking us to perform Kurt Weil songs, um, but kind of transposed to sort of a blues 
and sort of like, and very black musical aesthetic and, um, and kind of in this sort of transatlantic kind of black ensemble, it was the first time where I was asking some of these questions that I was asking in my own work, but in relationship to other experiences that I hadn't had, but that there was this kind of, um, yeah, my, you know, this kind of um, fabric that preceded us in a way that allowed us to um, collaborate with a lot of joy and seriousness. Um, and then the project was also, I mean, it, you know, the project was about Baron Sandy, who's a figure in Haitian Vodun. Um, so like not a casual figure to make a work about. And what's interesting about that project is that it was also surrounded by a lot of birth and death. Um, and um, so I think we both got a lot from it and sort of paid the price of working with such a, I think, um, kind of, um, complicated and powerful figure as Baron Sandy, invoking him in our work. Um, like, and, you know, um, in the summer of 2011, right when we started, Dorothy comes and, and you were pregnant with your first child and, um, and another performer had just given birth two months before and then you were pregnant with your second child by the time our tour was over. So there was three births that were associated. That's what that's why I'm sharing that information. I hope it's okay. Um, and then there were also three deaths. Um, so Alan's nephew died in a car accident, I think the year that we started rehearsing. And then Alan's partner, Alain, passed away and then Alain passed away. So that project kind of was, you know, speaking of spirits in the room, I think it's also, we were, were bound by these kind of portals between life and death. Um, and, I, and to have had the honor of working on a project that had that kind of depth and um, I'm sort of eternally grateful for that, so that's what I'll say about it. Yeah, for me, um, meeting David and Will and uh, Nadia and Shengiwe and Olivier and all the, the collaborators was truly life-changing because Alain, uh, when he invited me for, for this, I guess he, it, it was an audition, but he had already um, made, up, made up his mind um, but it was nice that I went through that process because I'm, I, I also got to engage with Kurt Weill's, uh song um, for that audition. And Alain has really changed me in, in, in a very deep, uh, deep way. Even yesterday again, I was thinking of him and uh, being in that space and... Um, and the questions that he asked us, the first one, I, I, remember, I remember very clearly, he, uh, we were in Nîmes rehearsing and he invited us to, to share um, a story, uh, an intimate story uh, or a fictional one. And David went up, Will went up, Shengiwe went up, everybody went up and then I was last to go up on stage. Um, and uh, when I spoke about my my journey, I was really talking about Rwanda, the whole pre-colonial era until 1994, the 6th of September, which is the date that um, the president at the time, uh, his plane was shot down. And when it was shot down, uh, it provoked the beginning of the genocide of the Tutsi in Rwanda. So that's that's when I stopped my monologue. And um, Shengiwe got up and she went to the bathroom to weep and I found her. And I was, while I was consoling her, I asked myself, what were people doing when my people were being massacred in 1994? And that question is actually the same one I'm still asking myself. Uh, whenever I see atrocities going on around the world, I'm still like, what are we doing? How are we engaging with the world? How are we engaging with the, 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 the different um, situations that, that um, should actually strike us in the heart, you know, uh, and move us to action. And, um, and I started writing a text at that moment, which became the material for Samedi Détente, which is my first work. Um, and so meeting Alain, uh, I also got to engage with this question of the diasporic body, because at the time I was quite preoccupied with Rwanda, France, Europe, Africa, da, 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 this binary 
relationship. And then with him, I met these wonderful performers from the America that I had been to, but not engaged with the artists, right? And that journey brought me then back and forth. I see Angela has come into the room as well. Who invited me wonderfully in a year that also changed my life, 2016, when I came to perform and uh, for a residency uh, at TBA at that time, Pika, And that also was another addition to how these journeys back and forth can truly change one's trajectory. And Alain uh, was one of those people that, um, that has changed us, it has changed me in a way. I'll just add like that your performance also that you're doing again tonight, like there's a line and it was like, is there a helping hand? Mm. Um, which really struck my heart last night and just appreciate your in insistence on that question and posing it in your work. Mm. So thank you for that. Thank you too. Yeah. I think that's good, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can I add one thing? I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, thank you all of you, for I, really, for making it work. I know it's a lot of work to make us come all the way to the United States to perform and things like this, at times such as these. So thank you. Thank you, thank you.